dear brothers and sisters in Christ. The year was 9 AD. It was a cold and rainy day in the Tudorberg Forest of Northwest Germany. This was not a day that you wanted to be in those dark woods if you were a Roman legionary. You see, heading into those woods, they were a bit too overconfident in their strategy and ability and experience. They underestimated their enemy hiding in those thick woods. And so as they entered into those woods, they faced an ambush. The Cheruski tribe of German warriors came out and, and ambushed the Roman legions, three legions going into those woods. That German tribe led by a man known to history now as Hermann the German, whose statue stands of all places, looming over the city of New Ulm, Minnesota. There he is. Three mighty Roman legions were attacked over a period of three days and were slaughtered. Despite the superior training, weaponry of the Roman legions, they stood no chance for the hit-and-run guerrilla tactics of the Cheruski tribe, those German fierce warriors. Because of this epic defeat, Rome never conquered Germany. And the Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, that same Caesar Augustus, was left bewildered and seething with revenge and a bit afraid, in fact, too, that this was going to come to Rome's doorstep. Only a few people survived, were able to get out of those woods safely and make it back to Rome. The story that they told when they got home about this epic defeat, trying to explain what happened, the only interpretation people could have is that somehow there must have been supernatural forces fighting against them. So, okay, why am I telling you this story, this ancient battle story from long, long ago? Well, today, friends, it's because I think it's an illustration for what the Apostle Paul wants us to see in our sermon text today. That we ourselves, even in this modern world, are still very much engaged in a battle against an unseen enemy force, albeit a very supernatural one. One that wants us to underestimate them, overestimate ourselves, think to ourselves, well, I'm smart. I'm strong. I would never let it go that far. I can handle things on my own, make my own choices, and so lose that battle. And that's why today in God's Word, what the Apostle Paul wants us uh, to see, what, what God really wants to do in this concluding passage of Ephesians, is to equip us so that we can suit up and stand firm. And so today our focus is going to be this, to stand firm in the fight, understanding who the real enemy is, wearing the full armor God provides, and remaining vigilant in prayer for God's people. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. He says, finally... And this is the last part here today. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Okay, so, ooh, all right, today we come to the end of Paul's letter to the Ephesians that we've been studying the last couple of weeks. Uh, we've learned about the great hope we have in Jesus Christ. No greater hope, right? And, and we've learned, too, in the second half of Ephesians how God wants us to respond to that hope that we have by living pure, holy lives. 
putting on the new self, putting off the old self, imitating God. But here at the end of Ephesians, Paul's closing words today are are a reminder that that this struggle, this battle, this tension that we face to do that is going to be ongoing until the very last day when Jesus comes back to take us to be with him in the glory of heaven. And Paul doesn't want us to lose that struggle until that glorious day. Until then, we're in the midst of a very real, spiritual, in nature, fight. That's why Paul says in verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Because as long as we live here on this earth, there is a constant danger that we would be lulled into a kind of spiritual complacency. Even while surrounded by material prosperity, everything is okay, everything's good. Because I've got a lot. Right? There's a constant danger that temptations would ambush us, undefended in our unguarded and weak moments that we would overestimate our ability to stand firm and not take it that far and not do those things, or to think, well, I can do as I please. A temptation, a constant danger to be influenced by the, the false teachings and corrupt philosophies of this world so that we would actually, while trying to keep some outward veneer of the Christian faith, forsake faith in Jesus himself and so forfeit eternal salvation. And so in in light of all this, what Paul is trying to do is to remind us that we will not be strong enough in this fight if we just coast on our own strength and resources, but that we're only strong enough to stand firm if we are in the Lord and in his mighty power. In other words, don't make the same mistake that those Roman legionaries did on that day in the forest of Germany overconfident, underestimating their enemy, and losing to this unseen force, hiding in the woods. If we're going to stand firm in this fight, we need to take to heart, Paul is saying, the the, the truth that only in the, the, the Lord's unlimited resources that he provides can we be strong. Because, did you catch it? Who's our enemy? He says it's the devil. Again, verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And then he goes on to describe various divisions within the devil's demonic army. He exposes, so to speak, this battle against these spiritual forces whose aim is to destroy us, body and soul, to ambush our souls, to destroy our faith in the Lord. And in the same way that our modern military has various ranks, right? He's kind of saying it's the same thing when it comes to the devil's legions of demons. So we're talking today, stand firm in the fight first of all, by understanding who our real enemy is. Now, I, know, I understand, perhaps you're thinking, well, okay, are, are you serious, Pastor Ben? I mean, here we are in the year 2023, 20, and we've got AI technology that can augment human intelligence. We've got all this modern stuff. We've got all, like, this is the modern world. We've got science and everything. We've got all this technology around us, and and here you are. You're talking about the devil and, and demonic forces that you say are very much at work trying to just, like, convince us of lies and lead us down a path that, that, that takes us headlong away from God through, through corrupt ideologies and all kinds of, you know, temptations in this world. Are you serious? And friends, my answer is, yeah, yes, I I am serious. In this modern world in which we live, where we are surrounded by so many material comforts and 
pleasures and pursuits and all this technology, how often don't we overlook and forget about this whole spiritual dimension to life? As if we're just machines, just animals, and not embodied spirits, body and souls, meant to live in relationship with, with God. How often don't we view problems in this life in terms of merely their biochemical or their purely material components, right? And so come up with solutions addressed only to those things. How often don't we look at the problems in this world as merely political ones? Us versus them, the good guys versus the bad guys, if we just have the right people who think the right way, then everything will be better, but it never seems to work, does it? Why? Well, the Bible's answer is this is a, a different worldview than we have in our modern world. The Bible's worldview here in Ephesians chapter 6 is that there is this whole spiritual dimension to life that we just kind of try and push out of our minds in this modern world. And so what Paul's doing is he's kind of trying to pull back the curtain, so to speak, on our material world, our materialistic world, to see what's really going on behind the scenes and to show us who our real enemy is. That is the devil and his demons. And their aim is to destroy and to corrupt and with lies to ambush our souls. And so as God pulls back this, this curtain for us today, he, he then reveals the nature of the battle that we're really in, a battle for whether we will follow God's word wherever it leads. Will we, will we hold firmly to the word of God like Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, then you are really my disciples? Or will we simply follow our hearts and our feelings and the changing moral standards of the world. Which will we choose? A battle for whether we will trust in God's promises or whether we will put our ultimate trust, we'll pay some lip service to God's promises, but what we really trust in is the science with a the in front of it, right? A battle for whether we will uphold, cherish, and cling to what God considers good and right or whether we will continue to promote for months on end what God says is evil and celebrate the very opposite of what God's word calls good. Make no mistake, our real enemy is the devil, the father of lies, just like Jesus said. Paul, he had an interesting way of saying this, right? He said, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. They're not made of the same stuff we are, in other words. And then he goes on to say at the end, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, that is, in the, in the supernatural realm or dimension of things. This is where our enemy works. Who's our real enemy? Consider this, even in the relationships that you have or the, the conflicts that you have with people, consider for a moment that perhaps your real conflict isn't with that person per se, that that's your enemy. This is how we frame things, right? But really with the devil who's trying to influence them and you to believe lies. So let's talk about the devil, huh? The devil... The devil's real. Now, not God. Not even close. God is the creator. Right? The devil, all he can do is destroy. His power, though, the devil's power, is not unlimited like God's is. His power is limited. Like a snarling dog chained to a post. He's got to reach. You don't want to get too close. If you do, look out. But the most important thing to know about the devil in the Bible, however, though, is that he's 
a loser. In fact, he's already lost the war. We have a champion who holds the field forever, like we just sang, whose name is Jesus Christ. Our champion, our hero, who overcame every single one of the devil's lies. Who stood his ground against every single one of the devil's fierce temptations. Every single time, every single occasion, he stood his ground against every evil scheme. And what did Jesus do? He beat the devil at his own violent game, triumphing over him at the cross. And shortly before he rose from the dead to prove his victory publicly, he proclaimed that victory over the devil in hell itself to declare, you are the loser, I am the winner, you have no claim on my chosen people. And now who Jesus lives and rules at the right hand of the Father for the good of his church until he comes back on the last day to judge the living and the dead. And as the Bible says, to cast the devil into the lake of fire, bringing all of us home forever. So, today we're talking about how to stand firm in the fight, understanding who the real enemy is. And, and here's some more good news, friends, right? Though the devil is a loser and a, a sore loser at that, we don't have to be afraid of him. Because of the help and the strength that our ever-present God promises to provide so that we can stand our ground and win the victory. Paul goes on to say, Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fit fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God. Mm. So here Paul sort of brings this whole cosmic epic battle down to the level of us individuals. We're talking about how to stand firm in the fight, wearing the full armor God provides. Because temptations to sin will come. False teachings that sound good will come. There may yet be dark days ahead for those who seek to hold on to the truth of God's word in this world. God alone knows, but there may yet even be in your own life or mine some tragic loss, some... Some catastrophe that we never would have hoped for that comes out of the blue and, and challenges our faith. And yet, what a great comfort that God in his wisdom and love promises to provide us everything that we need to stand our ground in this fight to keep the faith through it all. To stand firm in this fight against the devil's lies and finally, to stand, to stand wearing that full armor that God provides so that we can win the victory. So Paul, right, Paul knew firsthand the, the kind of battle gear or equipment that a, that a Roman soldier would wear. In fact, some commentators think with good reason that as Paul is writing this letter to the Ephesians, we know that he's under house arrest in Rome and it's quite possible that he was actually chained to a Roman soldier at that time. So for him, just imagine, this is a very powerful and vivid and personal kind of 
application that he makes. He describes a Roman soldier and a Roman soldier's gear and, and in the order that a soldier would put these things on. And understand what he's doing. He's, he's, he's describing it in terms of, of the defensive capabilities of these pieces of, of gear. Right? The picture is, here's, here's how God's going to protect you with the belt of truth against the devil's lies, the breastplate of righteousness that covers your vitals and keeps you alive, the, the boots on your feet. He calls them the, you know, fitted with the, the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. You're, you're ready. You don't have to freak out at everything that comes by in your life. You don't have to, you don't have to go to pieces with because you, you have peace in the gospel. The, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, he describes these five pieces of, of armor that defend us and then a sword. Right? So the, the picture as a whole is defensive. The point in total, when you think about what each of these things represents, the point in total is really to take us back to the completed, all-sufficient work of Christ on our behalf. Everything that Jesus did as our perfect substitute, he provides now for us to keep us safe. And just like Paul in this letter to the Ephesians, right, in chapter 4, he talked about putting on the new self. Remember that illustration? Put on that new self. He goes back to that idea here and says, oh yeah, after you put on that new self, now put on the full armor of God. Because this is true, isn't it? It is only Christ's righteousness, his perfect life, credited and given to us to wear. That protects and covers us and keeps us safe because we now are holy in the sight of God even despite of all of our many sins. We're covered with his righteousness. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we believe the good news of the gospel, the gospel that forgives our sins, that gives us peace, that establishes our identity as dearly loved children of God. It gives us this sure and certain hope of eternal life with God in heaven at the end of it all. He has in store for me the crown of eternal life and heavenly glory. It is mine by faith. Because Jesus Christ, our champion, our hero, our savior, he's the one who has has triumphed over, who has conquered sin and death and the power of devil, the, the devil, all the forces of hell, he did that through his, his cross and his empty tomb and who now lives and rules over all things for our good. We are safe from the devil because we have a Savior who gives us the victory. All this, this good news of the gospel, this is our defense, this is our armor against all the devil's lies and temptations and all the ways that he wants to to lead us into sin, to get us to despair of ourselves and to just give up completely. Friends, don't give up. Don't ever give up. The battle is not lost. Even in your life when the battle against temptation is fierce and you have fallen again and again and again, your Savior Jesus has never stopped loving you. And it is for you that he went to the cross to give up his perfect life. Our weapons aren't just defensive, though, right? He also describes this one thing he calls the the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, right? Our weapons aren't drones or guns or fists or knives. Our our weapons aren't lies or propaganda. Our, Our weapons are God's words of truth, Against the devil's lie. Who am I? I am a baptized child of God. You, you don't have anything to say to me, Satan. I am his. Our, our, our weapons are the words of God that he gives us in the Bible. Spirit-empowered words that cause the devil to flee. As Hebrews 4 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. 
kind of cool, huh? This all speaks to wanting to use God's word well, right? At the beginning, I brought up that old battle in the woods of northwest Germany, right? And what got me thinking about that was actually just a a couple of weeks ago, I I saw online how a really cool-looking Bronze Age sword was discovered in, in southern Germany of all places, in a pile of bones and skulls and stuff like that, right? Which is kind of weird, but, but then you see, like, this sword, 3,000 ye- plus years old, it's still gleaming, right? And it's like, you just walk, walk over there, like, I just want to go pick up that sword and just, like, sh- like, brandish it in the air and wield that thing. It looks as sharp as the day it was buried there with all those decaying bones, And then I think to myself, you know, God's word in the Bible is just like that. Even in this modern world, where we're quick to run to podcasts and self-help stuff, and the last thing we even think about anymore is to pick up a Bible and to spend some quiet time each day with God's word and these spirit-given truths, it's right there. Just like that sword, it still gleams. Even though the sword there was lost and forgotten for so many years, right? It could be a thousand years from now, we could live in some crazy thing, you know, space age thing, and, and the sword is still going to be sharp. Friends, I'm talking about God's word. Because the battle then will still be the same. The battle against sin and death and the power of the devil. But friends, whether we access this sword in the pages of God's word in the Bible or the digital apps and communication tools that we have, it still is powerful. All we need to do is go pick up that sword again. God's word is and always will be our, our only weapon to protect and to promote this great hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Okay, last part today. We're talking how to stand firm in the fight, remaining vigilant in prayer for God's people. Paul says, and, and pray, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me. That whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Pray in the Spirit. What does that mean, pray in the Spirit? Is that like some sort of charismatic prayer that like only people who sort of leveled up spiritually can, can pray? Is this like some sort of prayer that's more effective, like you can tap into more God power with this kind of a prayer than some ordinary prayer that just like any of us would pray. No. Remember, our great hope in Jesus Christ, our hope, right? Through faith in Jesus Christ, each of us now has a relationship with the God of the universe. As Paul prayed earlier, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he might help you to see his power, how how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. That you would know this love that surpasses knowledge. That's what he's praying for all of us to know that we have this relationship with God. He is our Father now. We are his children now. He loves us now. He always will. So we can go to him and pray to him at any time, anywhere, for anyone. What a privilege it is to, to pray to the one whose power is unlimited and to, to do that with confidence, right? So maybe just as an application here at the end, I would ask, do you have a, a prayer list? Are there people that you are regularly praying for in your life? I can't tell you how much it's meant to me over the last 
let's just say last year, those of you that have sent me a little note, a handwritten card, a text message, or just said, hey, Pastor, I don't know what you're going through right now, but I just want you to know I'm praying for you. I'm praying that you remain strong in the Lord. I can't tell you what it means. That people from my, the congregation I served five plus years ago who still reach out to me once in a while and just say, I don't know if you've been going through a hard time, but I just want you to know I'm praying for you. So glad you're down there in Florida sharing the love of God with people. Hope I'll get to meet him one day in heaven. I'd imagine, it's just me, one day the Lord's going to show me how it is and how it was that, that it was the prayers of God's people that kept my heart from going astray, that, that blessed the words that I speak, that gave me whatever I needed in order to just stand firm in this spiritual battle against the enemy and kept my, my feet from falling. Wouldn't that be a cool thought, too, for you? So consider how you might have a, a little list of people that you're specifically praying for. Maybe it's a little old school, you know, sticky note or something that you put on the bathroom mirror that you're praying for people while you brush your teeth. Or maybe it's in the, the Bible app. They've got this cool feature now, prayers. You can type in a little prayer and then you can, you can actually share it with specific people and then they can pray it and they can hit like the little heart button and it says, you know, so-and-so prayed for me. Cool. All right. I can do that maybe. I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of you already do this or you do it specifically for your, your close family, which is awesome. Don't stop doing that. Maybe my encouragement is just expand that a little bit to include some people from your church family, your family in Christ. Maybe it's somebody you haven't seen in a while, somebody you know is going through a hard time. Somebody, as you, as you talk during the meet and greet or after the service, just kind of shares, like, something going on in their life, and, and you can let them know, I'm going to pray for you, and you can follow up, and you can text them, and you can say, hey, the Lord is with you. Be strong. And finally, the last thing I would say is, when you think about praying for people, my encouragement would also be to remember to pray for people that you're maybe in conflict with or frustrated with or if there's anybody that's just like, at least this personality is just hard to deal with or at work, like there's some people that just rub you the wrong way all the time. I tell you what, it's a lot harder to be in conflict with somebody if you are actively praying for them. To remember that, okay, who's my real enemy here? It's not this person per se, it's the devil. Right? To pray for God's people and to pray against the devil. And in this way, Paul's encouragement here, with our great hope, we can stand firm in the fight understanding who our real enemy is, wearing the full armor God provides, and remaining vigilant in prayer for God's people. May the Lord grant it. Amen.